How are you doing guys and welcome to a new video. So for those of you that have watched part one on Bradley's channel and now coming over for the first time, my name is Joshua Daniel George, a social media marketer and online coach. Really hope you enjoy the content that you see on my channel and that you consider subscribing. For those of you that are already on my channel and just seeing part two for the first time, highly recommend you guys go over to Bradley's channel and watch part one before you continue here and watch part two. But for all of you guys watching this, sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. Yeah, I think be there's, there's benefits to both, right? Because you would, pro I would say, if we're talking, you know, and I feel like a lot of people only ever speak about the benefits, so it's good to speak about the negatives, right? And yeah. I think often people will look at people like me and you because we we make YouTube content and think we've got all of our shit together at all times. We don't. I'm no. putting out fires every day. Like I have, I have stressful nights, stressful times. And I bet there's days where you, you actually end up having to do six hours because you're dealing with a really high maintenance part. Like it's not all, it's not, you know, it's not all bloody uh, roses and, and money yeah. bags. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, you have days where it's definitely more difficult, but I think ours would come differently. Like yours may come with the fact like, you know what, you wake up and you've got the Liverpool games on, you're hung over, you've been out with the boys the night before and you've got to set some ads up and you're like, oh, for God, I just don't. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I won't necessarily have that stress because of the infrastructure I've got in place. However, yeah. my stress would probably come from the fact that, you know, I've got such high level of overhead right now. But it's not that, what's, well, what's, what's crazy about my overhead is almost all of my overhead is employees, okay? So yeah. it's not overhead that I can get rid of. Mm -hmm. also if i want to scale my overhead always scales with me so realistically if i'm if i want to get to double my client database i'm gonna have to double the amount of media buys that i have in my team which means my expenses as i want to grow the company and my fixed expenses of stuff that are due every single month like my office rent like my employees as stuff that i'm in contract with you know i can't not pay my employees so you know there's a lot more risk but then the, our day to days are very different because because I'm at a stage now where I've got a, I've got a sales team, I've got a service delivery team, I've got a handful of media buyers, and then we've also got um, management in place. Everything on a day to day, so you know the sales is taken care of by sales team, um, that comes through to the service delivery team. Service delivery team handle that, and then anything on a day to day. When it comes to interviews, when it comes to, you know, we had to fire somebody this year, um, whether that's, you know, giving somebody praise or, you know, action in some kind of uh, system in the business. Yeah. I've last nine months or so when I've been or six to nine months since I've had management in place, I've been working very closely with him. So he knows my standards, the structure of everything. So my goal now is if I have something I want to implement, I'm more of like an idea person. Like, right, I have an idea that I want to have some kind of retention bonus in place for the service delivery team I'm just using yeah. that as an example i then throw that to the management and say come to me with a few ideas um and then ones that i like we'll sit down we'll have a meeting and then once i've decided on the decision he can action that down the line and i yeah. can just check in with him so my day-to-day -day is very much like my have to do on a day-to-day -day is very small it's check my emails check my slack and most of the time there's nothing in there because it's already being taken care of for okay, management yeah. It's just my time is not, I have to do it. It's more, okay, if I want to progress forward as a business, I can then build the systems. I can then come up with the ideas. I can then, you know, I, I, you know, I can say, I want to make the decision, right? We want to go into to TikTok ads tomorrow. Let's hire and create a department. I'm not the one creating that department. I make the decision that gets passed down the management. So it's very different. But so my day-to-day -day is less busy. Um, and I don't have the stresses of waking up and thinking, right, I've got an eight hour, 12 hour day today. I've got to do all this stuff. Not that you do, but I'm just saying yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. someone else in your position if, if, who's just starting out might have that. But my stress comes from, right, I've got to make payroll next month. You know, yeah, right? exactly. if, if we're unprofitable, I can't, you know, so, but that for me, it, that motivates the hell out of me because it's like, mm -hmm. you hear people say a lot of the time, um, if you want to get the Porsche or whatever, if you buy the Porsche, you'll figure out a way to make the payments. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's an argument like I'm very much like, you know, I will always figure it out. And that's why I love, I love the taking this risk. I love it. I thrive off it because it wakes me up in the morning. And I'm like, right, you know, I've got to make, I want to continue to grow the company. I want to get all these more people involved. I want to, I want to start this department, this thing. Um, and that comes with more overhead. And if I take the overhead on, I've got to make it work. Right. And it's, yeah. it's weird how I find some of the bigger risks that I've taken in my business. They've always paid off, you know, um, yeah. So it's just, it's, it's very, very different. And I don't think, I would say, I mean, for the average person, I would probably argue that the way that you do it is probably better for most people, I would say. 
I think it sort of depends on ultimately what you what you want. Yeah. You know, because um, I've I've also had like a period where I've got an office space and I was looking into hiring actual employees, um, and it just it just wasn't really the direction I wanted to go in. But it's not not necessarily that was the wrong decision or anything like that, or that my decision is the right way or vice versa. I think it just depends on what you want and what you where do you get the most um, what what the most satisfaction from basically. Like yeah. if I look at my dad for example, he hates my life. Like he hates really? having to sit at a desk and yeah. not being able to contact clients. He's very extroverted. Yeah. Even like if a client, so obviously you know, we're based in the Netherlands. If a client from Sweden says, "Listen." I like what you do. Let's meet up. He'll go to Sweden just because he loves it. He loves the physical. He loves the, like, you know, the, the actually being in offices and the corporate yeah. stuff. And, like he'd hate to have like what I've got, like the AC online and virtual. And like you, the only contact you've got is through Zoom. Um, so mm-hmm. it, it also depends on like what do you prefer? What what angle do you want to go uh, go for? And at the end of the day, it's, it's your decision. There's money. It, yeah, it depends way, right? money. I would say though on that note, it depends on what your goals are, right? Because... Yeah. If your goal is purely just profitability, well, how much money? Because realistically, the way that you're doing it right now, you would struggle to get to say like 300 grand a month, let's say, right? Because you'd have to be handling- The way it's structured now, yeah. The way it's structured now, right? Yeah. But you would probably adapt over time in all fairness. But so it depends how much money you're talking. If you just want to make 10, 20 grand a month, it's way easier doing it your way. Yeah. Because the amount of revenue you'd have to make, if, if I want to make 10 grand a month in profit, I've got to make a lot more in revenue because of all my costs. Yeah. So if you're talking about take home money, actual in pocket, your way yeah. is absolutely better. And as a beginner, for sure, your way is like a hundred percent better. And it, it depends what your goals are as well, because if your goal is to exit a company, my way is probably better. I don't want to exit my company, but I'm just arguing. Yeah, if, I yeah. wanted to sell, if I wanted to sell, my my structure would work because I am not attached to my business in theory whatsoever, besides being more of a CEO position, chairman, making decisions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so my business is probably more sellable. It just depends what people angle people want to go down. I would say. Yeah. No. Yeah. I definitely agree. Yeah. So if if um, I'll tell you what, before we get into that, I was going to say like what would be the next step. But before we get into that, let's just go back to when you hired your first employee, which was yeah. Kai, right? Yeah, Kai. Yeah. Yeah. So what was that like? And like, what? Why? Why did you make that decision? And what? What was it like the first time? Yeah. You hired everyone? Well, I mean just as a bit of like value on the front of this what i will say is my whole like the whole everything that i have a lot of the success um and a lot of the 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 bigger stuff the last year like the revenue has gone crazy last year like we've grown crazy we've um we've 10x our amount of employees in a year like we basically hired an employee a month like we've got offices last year we did that is coming like 12 month period is like the success overnight thing that's taken me four years of knowledge prior to that to get to yeah. this stage. But if you look at everything, like everything that was done, including the decision to hire my first employee, everything was done like baby steps. Like the first time I landed a client, I was like fully blagging it and I was a freelancer and I was working. It was an hourly contract. And I don't know if I've mentioned this much online on my YouTube channels when I've said my story, but my first actual job on Upwork, it was for like, I think it was 500 bucks a month, right? But that was 500 bucks a month on an hourly contract. So I was actually working for $7 an hour. Now I was that desperate to quit my job. I don't, I didn't care if I was making $2 an hour. Like generally I was like, I'm going to work a hundred yeah. hours a week if I have to, to quit my job. If I have to cut out all my expenses. But you look then, this first step was, I, I, would not, I wouldn't have got a client for two grand a month with a media buyer in place. My first client, like I worked hourly for seven bucks an hour and got that first client. That first yeah. client led to my second client that led to my third. And then I started to outsource. I made mistakes because I outsourced to crappy people. And I learned that the hard way, but I learned to outsource nonetheless. And then from that, you know, so you progress up the line. And then same with my first employee, my first, the decision to hire my first employee, I never had, I did I wasn't thinking, right, I'm going to hire this first employee. That's, that's the first one I'm going to hire because then in 12 months from now, I'm going to have you know, 10 employees and I'm going to have offices. I was just, I was making that decision right there. Um, And it was, what I would say is it was as scary as hell. And I had to learn everything. Like there was no course or anything to go through. I was like, right, how do I hire someone on payroll? How do I pay their salary? There's national insurance, there's tax. Like, you know, I, when I used to be an employee, when I got my pay slip, like my tax was already paid. So I was thinking, do I have to pay that? Does my accountant pay that? Who pays that? I was like, I didn't know. So I learned all of this stuff, but to answer your question, I suppose the value I'm trying to give there is that 
just take baby steps first of all yeah. like yeah. if you want to grow to a thousand employees one day you've got to hire your first employee it starts with that yeah. you would do everything you might do a lot wrong but you'll get there and for me it was very it was again i speak about my biggest risks that i take being the biggest benefits when i was used to outsourcing everything online the reason i made the decision is because I, I thought to myself, I keep outsourcing all of this stuff online. I, I totted up all my different costs and how much I was spending on different things. I was like, well, I'm spending spending a similar amount of money to what it would cost me to hire somebody full time. Yeah. And I bet if I could have somebody full time, not only could I have them do more than what's already being done, but I could control the standards. I can control the quality. And I was I'm in an iron about doing it. And like I do with a lot of things in business is I make the decision and then I figure it out, right? I, I wasn't yeah. worried about how was I going to make payroll. I wasn't worried about, I knew if I make the decision to hire, then I'll figure it out. So I made the decision and it was a big risk at the time, you know, like hiring someone, having somebody committed on payroll. It was, it was scary, you know, mm -hmm. but I did it. And then I figured it out and it was the best thing I've ever done because then all of a sudden the quality of my results started going up because I could control the standards when I wanted stuff done, I didn't have to wait two days for a response. It could be done within 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, I started to be able to automate other parts of my life and almost build, start to build more of a real company than just some kind of like outsourced online company. So for me, that was um, one of the best decisions I ever made was hiring Kai and, and making that very first decision. And, um, you know, his head likes to get nice and big because of it these days, because I always say it's <laughs> one of the best decisions I make. And he's like, right, it's yeah. my, the success of the company is down to me or whatever. Um, we always have a laugh about that. But yeah, honestly, he, he's still with me to this day. Um, yeah. I'm super loyal employee and, and fantastic. And um, yeah, it was scary, man. I mean, you, you've gone a quite different direction. You've not got somebody on payroll, but you basically have uh, an employee, right? Sort of with. Yeah. So uh, now. Obviously, yeah, so obviously we've got a bunch of like VAs and stuff like that, just for like yeah. on and off jobs. So like we were talking yesterday, you know, we were talking like data miners. Like I don't have a full time data miner, but if that I that wouldn't make sense, would it? No, all? but if, if I need if I need like a hundred emails of business owners within a certain niche, I'll just hire a data miner. I've I've got that. It's always the same data miner. I always use the same guy, yeah. but he's not like a full time. He's not on a full time gig. So there's two people that are on full time. One of them just being like a full-time VA that just basically just handles my my day-to-day -day, you know stuff, yeah. um, and then the other one is Elliot, who was my very first full-time sort of employee. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's on a freelancer basis, like they both are. Um, and the way that sort of worked out was um, it was just after we parted ways. To be fair, yeah. we uh, so we both decided that you know it was in both of our best interests to sort of you know carry on with our own agencies rather than you know keep it all together. And then I landed a very big client, which back, back, the retainer was 10K a month, which back then was like, you know, mind blowing. It was like yeah. the very first time I've ever had a client that big. And there was also a rev share on the back end, which the way they presented it sounded like that could very quickly be a seven figure, you know, a seven figure deal. So what I then said to Elliot, because he was already banging on the door saying, listen, um, I'm working a sales job for a um, for a car dealership. I like sales, but I don't like the car dealership. I don't like working, you know, physically at like this rat race nine to five. And he at the time was starting up his own e-com store. So, you know, he's got his own clothing brand, which now is actually doing very well. But back then it was just, you know, it was just starting out and we invested more into like his first launch and stuff like that. And he realized, okay, there's potential here, but I need to give him more attention. So he was already saying, listen, I need, I need an online gig because I'm, I'm also starting this online business. You know, I need, I need to transition to everything online because now um, I'm physically checking in at nine, I'm leaving at five, and then I'm getting home by the time I get home. It's like six, you have yeah. some sweet. And then I've got like three hours before I need to go to bed um, to, to work on this online business. You know, this way uh, I can sort of combine both. So yeah, that on the one end, um, he already had, so we already had a, a limited company, you know, for, for his e-com store. Yeah. And on the other end, I've just landed this major client and I knew that, okay, because this was before I understood, understood like Facebook ads and media buying. But I thought, okay, if I'm going to keep this client, because I think back then the lifetime value of a client for us was like three months tops. Yeah. Like, the only other time a client would stay longer is if they just left us to it and they weren't really bothered. So if they had enough money to, to keep us on, they would, um, you know, but if, if they were actually looking at the results we were getting, our lifetime value back then was like three months. 
So I thought, okay, I don't want this client to leave for three months because it's such a big client. It's such a big opportunity. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, if, if this is going to work, I'm going to have to be in the trench myself and either learn media buying to a certain extent where I know who I'm outsourcing it to is actually doing a good job yeah. or just continue on and do a full time, the media buying. So um, I told Elliot, okay, listen, like this is what's coming up. You need to man the ship, you know, while I'm sorting this stuff out, um, manage the clientele and basically, you know, work your way up and, and figure it out as we go along. And at the time, the plan was that he became the CEO of the agency. And I, because for this 10K a month client, we actually set up a whole different limited company. And the plan was that I would basically be the owner of two companies, but he'd be the CEO of one company and I find another CEO for this company. And um, it ended up not being, you know, the way I anticipated and expected because of the whole like lifetime value of the, the company, of, of the, the customers of the, 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 the client yeah, yeah. that we had wasn't as, uh, as long as we anticipated. So obviously the whole like, rev share was much lower than we anticipated. Um, we made the decision to get an office space, which ended up being like 5,000 euros a month in, in rent because we wanted it in the center of Amsterdam. So that was another like, bad decision on my part. Um, and then back then as well, Elliot, because that back then the stress for me was I hired someone to be a CEO of a company that he had no experience in. Um, so he's doing, he's managing sales, he's managing the media buying, he's managing the clients, etc. And he's got zero experience. Obviously, that's it's a mistake from me to put him like in a deep end yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But to be fair to him, like the, after three months, he picked it up like very, very quickly. Like after three months, he was basically, I think knowledge-wise, he he, he knew it just as much as I did. You know, he, he was understanding what, um, how the agency worked, etc. cetera. Um, so at the end, we, we basically just agreed, okay, you know, I come back to the agency. I'll, you know, sort of be the CEO again. You just focus on the front end because his sales skills are, are really, really good to be fair. So I said, yeah. if, if that's what you enjoy, if that's what you're good at, you just focus on that. And then I'll focus on the back end and the systems. And that's sort of how that whole relationship emerged. And now it's like, he does the front end, I do the back end. And I think that's where, like you said, that's where we sort of went wrong because we are both like the introverts. Yeah. Yeah. And he he's the opposite to me. He's the extrovert yeah. and I'm the introvert. So it works. So I can just do I can just manage the systems, I can manage the back end. Um, and he's on the front end prospecting and, and getting on calls. And I think like, you know, you, you speak about that, it's done, you know, it's basically he's an employee, right? He might not be on payroll, but he is. Yeah, but he is, he's full-time. Right? Yeah. Pretty much full-time. And for you, this is where giving up control, I think, and this is, I think, probably both of our strengths. What one of what a lot of people struggle with as entrepreneurs, as they start to scale and grow, is giving up control. You have yeah. to give up control. You also have to understand people will make mistakes. And, uh, and you say you made a mistake throwing him kind of in the deep end and making him learn quickly. But I would also kind of argue, yeah, you probably, if you were to hire again now, you would probably have a checklist or a structure to, yeah. to tick yeah, him off on the way, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like partly the fact that you were, you were so willing to give up control, I would argue is partly why he's had so much success because you thrown him in the deep end, he was forced to swim, you know? Um, yeah. And he's had, and, and I would... You know, similar to me, I I owe like all the success of the company. Like, obviously, a lot of it was built from me, but I wouldn't be a I wouldn't have a successful company if it wasn't for my employees. And if if I never hired Kai initially, I owe so much of the success of the business to Kai and the fact yeah. that he helped me get it off the ground and get it to where it is today. Um, and I know you, it's the same with you and Elliot, right? Like, you owe a lot of the success you have with your business now to um, to Elliot, but it, it proves the power of what you were saying, right? Uh, but I mean, I feel like that's another thing where we're so similar. It's like, the give, we've never struggled to give up control, I feel. Ever. No, no, definitely not. In it's, the beginning, uh, that was for the negative though, right? Because we would give up control to anybody and think it would be yeah. okay. Whereas now I give up control, but with a very strict eye, eye on the standards and we have yeah. a set structure and system that they follow. So it's like, we give up control because we've got the systems in place and we, yeah. we have the structures that work, um, which is a mistake we probably made back then because we didn't have that. No, but back then it was just like, get the clients in, outsource it for as cheap as we possibly can, and then just, you know, go on to the next one. And I feel like they, I feel like now the industry is also slowly changing to a point where if you don't care about the results, you're not going to get very far. You're gone, yeah. Uh, yeah, like I, I see the same with you as well, like on uh, Facebook stories, Instagram stories, you'll show results of your clients 
And you can tell you're genuinely proud of the fact that you've just made your clients a shit ton of money. And I'm the same. Like if I get my clients results, it's the best feeling ever. They're happy. Yeah. You know, they're referring us on to other people. Our reputation is increasing on and offline. And back then, I, I feel like that just wasn't really the case with, no, not necessarily with us, but just in general, that in wasn't general, the yeah. whole aim of the game. The aim of the game was to, to live the last of lifestyle and have like money coming in for uh, the least amount of effort possible. Very different and now, though, isn't it? Now, it's, it's, obviously, it's also because of the amount of people that are now in the game. So there's much more competition and there's also much more, uh, many more companies now getting banned because people are still living in that old mindset. Yeah. So now you need to be able to get results for clients because otherwise they're going to leave you or you're never going to be able to scale the business properly. Well, that's why though, like we, we we're both very long-term minded, which is why we will both be around in 10, 15, 20 years. And a lot of these other people won't. Us as entrepreneurs from three years ago, we would fucking slaughter us. Like the old brandpreneur back in the day, if me and you both went up against them, we'd kill them. But the old Brad and Josh, we'd absolutely kill them in business with the results, with how, you know, long, short, we were very short term minded, I feel back then. And that's one of yeah. the big progresses we've both made. And I can spot in myself and you is like, and it is the way to be like client results. And the thing is as well, you can't get results for every client, right? Like a lot, there's so many factors that come into play. Yeah, if you have the best, if you have the crappiest company in the world with expensive products, bad shipping, clunky website, 40 day delivery time, it's not always down to the ads, right? But like, all you can do, I feel is that comes down to a couple of things. First of all, client selection. If you yeah. select the right client that you know you can help and you, and, and you master, master that. So like if you're in, in your scenario, you've got a set niche and you've got a set structure. So when you bring on a client, because you you qualify them and they're a set client you can crush it right and what yeah. that means is next time you go to a client in that same industry and you get killer results yeah, it's like you know what works and what doesn't you know what works and you just you just replicate the success and you'll grow and you have scaled massively because of it right um but yeah it's, it's interesting to see for sure yeah do you um because in terms of because you focus very much on fashion and apparel jewelry uh, e-com stores right yeah so we have a white label so basically we have kind of two structures to it when we go out and get clients directly right so like not white label um yeah. we we try and focus mainly on e-com stores yeah we we have worked with um we have worked with a lot of coaches and we've got some fantastic results we've worked with a lot of influencers as well um we've worked with some lead gen stuff but our bread and butter really is e-commerce yeah. um we've worked we, we we do we do really well i would say in fashion and also like the pet industry that's where we've got a couple of clients that are really absolutely like crushing it yeah. um but yeah so that, that that's what we we focus on mainly i would say and then we've also got the white label department where we also white label for other agencies um and, and we run ads on behalf of other agencies. And that's a bit more difficult because we don't control the niche. So we get a bit yeah. of everything come through. And also, which is sometimes difficult, I would say, but that is we do not always control the quality and the expectations that have been set, which also becomes difficult because, you know, there'll be results. I would, like I'll give an example, right? There's clients that we are literally turning like, like 15 grand a month into like 250K a month for them, right? So we're generating like three mil a year from about under 200 grand a year in spend. Like stuff like mind-blowing results where they're blown away right there's not a dollar slipping through the net we've got like it's just crushing but then there's other clients that come on because they've just a brand new shopify store and we've got no control necessarily of the quality of that client that we're generating like zero sales for a month and it's like it's sometimes a very very contrasting which yeah. is um which is interesting but you know that's why our motto is always like we do the absolute best that we can but it's yeah so that's kind of the two main sources of income that we have in the yeah. industry. it's funny you should say that because so we tried the white the, with the white label i told you this yesterday as well with the, the white we started the white labeling for people that enrolled into my coaching programs that didn't fully grasp the facebook ads just yet yeah but managed to get a client and basically wanted someone to to you know, keep that client's afloat. You know, get the results of the client while this person's still learning on the job. That's how the white label started, yeah. and we just spread quite quickly. Okay, oh, Josh got this white label service. You know, let's check it out. But exactly what you said, you can't. The difficult thing is you can't manage the um, you know the, the expectations of the clients or the way that clients brought in. So if we're in my coaching program, um, and this will be the same for your coaching program and your. Uh, causes, etc. If someone comes through your systems, manage to get a client, they know what to say and what not to say. Yeah. But then when it's outside of that, you've got no control over it. So we got, for example, one 
we got someone email us saying, listen, um, I'm not in your programs, but I've heard you've got a white label service. Do you offer that to other people outside the program? So I thought, well, why not? You know, yeah. why not? You know, if it's if it's if they're willing to pay our fees, then you know, let's just give it a go. And this client comes in, and the client was an absolute. Uh, so we don't speak to the client, but the client speaks to the the agency. So it looks like, in the eyes of the client, it looks like it's the agency managing, but it's actually us on the back end. Yeah. Um, but the 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 way the the, the so the agency, our client, promised them the world, and then it was like, okay, go on, go and get them the world kind of thing. I was like, yeah, you can't it always do that like that, client, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's, and it, it's, it's difficult. We do it a little bit different. Just to jump in, sorry, is we we don't. So when we do white label, we actually do the Slack communication with the client as well. So that's a slight difference. That, ah, so okay, that's, that's interesting. Really, yeah, yeah. What um just to, so to follow on to that, how so how does the the agency know that you're I'm not you're not going to do it anyway? But how does the agency know that you're not just going to take that client? That's a trust thing. I would never ever do okay. that. A prime example yeah. is, you know, I've got very. You know, I can be, I can absolutely be ruthless when I need to be with certain things. Yeah. I do, however, I've got a very long-term mindset. And at the end of the day, my customers are my customers. I never make short-term money decisions ever. But that's yeah. one thing. That's one thing I can big myself up for that I know that like, you know, you can say this, that I've, I've got a lot of faults and I'm not the best entrepreneur in the world by far. There's lots of things I could be doing better. But one thing I know that I am good at is I will always make sure that I put my clients first. And if we, if we land an agency as a client, they are our client. The end yeah. user and the end client is still our client, but the, our main client is the agency, right? They're the yeah. ones that we're serving and via that we get to serve that other customer. So it's just a trust thing. Um, and an yeah. example is the other day, we, um, I was speaking to a prospect actually, and this was actually through Upwork. And one of our, one of our agency partners, um, well, they actually sent us a photo saying, look, we're actually, we want to hire a few people here and um, put them up against each other. And he sent a screenshot of his calendar. And it was by chance that on that calendar, I spotted one of our one of our agency partners. Yeah. So just by out of respect, I didn't I didn't pursue the job anymore. Now yeah. you could argue that was stupid because I could get this client directly at a much higher fee, probably arguably at least double the fee that we would get. Yeah. Anyway, it, it so happened that we the, the the guy that we left them to ended up getting the client and we started working on it indirectly for our white label team for that client and we're crushing it and we we're actually winning the, the the we're winning the deal right now over the other people now if we did that for ourselves we could have won that and got the money but my loyalty lies with my customer and i'm always going to put yeah. them first money decision or not my loyalty is with my customer so we've got that level of trust i've got that level of trust with a lot of our agency owner partners where we're like look we're always going to put you first we're not we're not gonna you know we're not gonna um we're not gonna poach the client uh, yeah, and we, we built this respect and trust over time. Like we've had an example. Um, uh, I won't say who, obviously, but <laughs> that basically they didn't enjoy the agent. To be fair, we don't work with them anymore. But like it wouldn't matter because they were a bit of a nightmare. But it was an agency owner that yeah. was literally what you said: overpromising the world, short-term money decisions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna promise you the world to get you through the door and get your money. Gets put to our white label team. We're acting on the behalf of this agency. Again, it's not they don't. It's not seen as outsourced. We we act as their team, as their media yeah. buyer. So yeah. we're in there communicating. It's like I just call them John. It's like John, John. Like the client would said, "Oh, John, the agency owner has yeah. promised that you could get a ten extra return." And yeah. we've got to then try and argue that back. Um, but anyway, at the end of the the month ends. Obviously, the client leaves after the month because results aren't there, and they message privately my media buyer and say we really didn't like working with john um, yeah. can we work together directly with you and obviously we screenshotted that message and sent it to our agency owner we didn't overly enjoy working with that agency owner but yeah. and, and 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 we didn't enjoy hey, it. There you go. Here is. um let me just whack my thing on record again all right we're uh so yeah, sorry, yeah sorry about that um uh, the agency clients screen yeah, so basically oh, yeah, yeah, so basically the agency client, um, so the actual end client messaged yeah. our media buyers directly and said, look, we don't want to work through this agency anymore, but we love you and your service. Can we work directly with you? He might, I don't know how they knew it was separate because we we go under their team, like everything, like yeah. there's no way they would have known unless something would have been said. Um, I, I could only assume based off of the overpromises that something was said on the sales call. Yeah. Um, but they basically said, look, we don't like this agency owner. Can we work with you? And just out of respect, because of the way my morals are, I'm like I just like you could say, well, I could have had extra revenue. I could have been making double what I was making and keeping the same client, same workload, everything's set up. Just, 
but uh, you know it's it's not i i i want to go to bed and sleep well at night and i want to put my customers first like i don't just say that i do it for the sake of social media like i generally put my customers first so anyway yeah that was another thing and when you do stuff like that over time that builds trust you know yeah. um so yeah we, we never have that kind of concern and we would never do anything like that if anything i'm too um too soft and too caring on my customers the fact it would cost me money as a business but i would rather i would rather run it like that because it's a long-term play in my in my eyes yeah well, i agree I'm, I'm sort of the same like I, so the reason why i always say with the white label obviously we don't really do it anymore now but when we did the white label the reason why we never spoke directly to the, their clients is because i did i didn't want to put that fear in the agency that we could potentially post them because i'd yeah. hate to be in that situation myself yeah. It's like one of them is like you don't. I wouldn't want to do something to someone, um, knowing that if it happened to me, I would not like the outcome. I wouldn't like that, you know, someone doing that to me. So I just sort of removed all that from the process and had that as the USP. Like, yeah, the client thinks it's you, not us. Well, that makes yeah. sense, you know. And and you know yeah. what? Again, this is a, this is one of those things where it's like. I just want to provide the best service. So we handle with the way we look at it is like, well, Slack communication is a big part of the job. So let's take care of that for you. So I see it as a value add. Um, but I suppose that comes from, you know, the, the whole reason I started it. And honestly, my goal would be to, um, my, my goal is to create the biggest and best white label company. Like I, I, I still yeah. want to very much run the agency too, but alongside that, and that was all built off the fact when we used to work together and we outsourced to media buyers, they are the, the shittest media buyers ever. They cost us so yeah. much money. Oh, you wouldn't man. hear from them for two days. The results were terrible. And I I almost built this off of an, a known fact that there's such a need for good, reliable outsourcers yeah. or media buyers um, in, in this industry. And people don't have the resources to hire and, and do it. And, you know, that's the selling point from us. It's like, look, I take all the risk. I hire. I've got payroll to me. Um, I implement the, the standards, the quality. I make sure the guys stay ahead of the curve when it comes to knowledge and results. And also, what happens if one of our media buyers falls sick? Don't worry, I've got a bunch of media buyers. So yeah. we've got, you know, I have to pay holiday pay. I have to pay sick pay. But don't worry, I've got a plan B when somebody falls sick. You're still covered. Whereas if it was just you directly and you are outsourcing to some guy online and they fell ill, what's your backup plan? You have to pay someone else. We yeah. have that covered. So it's a very good very good offer and only because i've been in the industry myself and we had job posts up literally every day i don't know if you remember looking for yeah. a media buyer yeah. and anybody who fits within margins is impossible to find like literally impossible anyone good yeah um, we learned that the that's hard. it it's any, anyone good like you could we could you could find if you really looked you could find someone to run your ads for let's say 200 pounds a month yeah but the results would be that bad that it just would not be worth it yeah i think personally um, I'd love to know your thoughts on this as well, is because the whole industry is based on how to get more clients, how to make more money, but it's it's never about how to get results. And I've, I've tried to say, because we, we even talked about this, didn't we, with, the, with the, the YouTube content before we actually started recording. When you record a how to get results, or this is what I learned spending X amount of money, no one cares, no one watches it. But when you put up a video saying, look how I signed four clients in the last week, you get like 2000 views in the first two days. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? Because we had this conversation now. We actually did a little experiment. We looked on my YouTube channel and yeah. we had, I had a video. If you exclude all the big ones that have ranked for keywords, like I've got a few that are doing well that are like ranked big. If you look at like, like social media, like SMA based content, right? Yeah. Stuff that hasn't ranked too well. It just basically the views are coming from recommendations or my current audience. I've got two videos pretty much next to each other, which is like one is, which is like how to get, how I signed five clients or how you can sign five clients in a week or something like that. And it's got like yeah. three and a half thousand views. And then next to it, I've got a video, which in my eyes is even more valuable, which is what I learned spending half a million pound in a month on a client ad account. And it's got like 900 views in a year. And like, I remember when I uploaded that, I was like, this video is going to bang. It's like, you know, and this was on one client as well. We, it was a really, really big client that we would spend like half a million quid basically in a year for this client ad, uh, in a month for this client, this client. And, um, it was the lessons in there are really, really good, right? Yeah. Most people, most media buyers never get to the stage where they ever spend that amount on a single ad account, let alone sometimes over their lifetime. So it was a, you know, really good video. And like when I remember I uploaded, it was like a 10 out of 10, like it tanked, like it was like the worst video I uploaded out of my previous 10. And it's just like, what? Yeah. Um, 
and yeah. that you know that's that could you could argue that's partly down to maybe a lot of it being a beginner audience but i would also argue it's a lot of people that just want they want to know the quick bullet like how can i get five clients yeah um, whereas when you when you want to run a real company it's not about how to get clients because if you can't keep them or if you can't retain them or build a good that's reputation it. or have good systems yeah. and services that's really what's going to allow you to scale in my opinion yeah 100 percent. i mean that's that's um obviously like the whole reason why we set up that second course yeah. uh, consult x is on how to actually learn pay traffic how to actually you know uh whether you, you, you become the media buyer of the agency or you just know what to do so you can outsource it or build a team around it that you know that's that's completely up to you but the yeah. whole point of consult x is okay you you now know how to get up to six figures. You now know you know how to get your first few clients. You now know how to make you know eight k a month, etc. Now what's next? You build mm-hmm. systems. You start training a team. You start um, actually focusing on getting the client's results. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if you get a client a good result, portfolio material, yeah. authority within that niche, referrals, but also the fact that because you know you can get that, it's 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 also like a confidence thing. If you've got four clients all in a certain niche and you're getting insane results for them, when you go into that call, you know, whether you've got a sales team or not, whether you go in, you know, whether your agency has that call with a new potential client in that niche, you can say, listen, the proof's in the pudding. You know, we're charging X amount and you're still going to profit from it. Everybody's going to win because, you know, we've we've got this down to a T. And the funny thing is, we're at, we, I still get more sales for Lifestyle Design, which is my beginner course on how to get started then consult X. And obviously, you know, that might be down to me not really promoting and pushing it as much, but it's also because the whole mindset is, um, you know, how to make a quick book rather than actually how to get results. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I think I think that's a really good point. And I, you, you, you know, like I said, you could argue some of which is just a lot of people are the beginners, but even if you are a beginner, I think learning that extra stuff, it's like, I don't know about you, but I've also found recently a lot of the stuff, like I read books three years ago that yeah. I reread now and they mean completely it's so different, different, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm maybe like, yeah. maybe it's a case that like you're not in the right time for that content. I mean, I don't know, but I, I, I find it's it's super if I could if I could rewind though and learn all of this stuff now, you know, you look at the last 12 months is when I've really scaled up more than anything, focused on the agency. Yeah. Like I had a lot of that information before. It was just a few things that I was missing. And like if I could go yeah. back to myself from three years ago. I could be oh, yeah. in the position yeah. I am now three years ago had I known that information. And it's not a regret because that's part of the progress that you make. But, um, you know, that's why I think it's so important to learn like systems build and hiring a team, like all this stuff that we made so many mistakes back in the day on on thinking short term and not making yeah. those focusing on results and stuff like that. It was um, super interesting. So on that note, then, like I suppose we could probably wrap this up on a couple of final questions then, which would yeah. be if we both had to go back and do it differently, which is a note we've got here, how would we do it differently? What would you do yeah, different? I think you've already just hit the nail on the head there with what you said before. I think it's so if if, if we look at how we do it differently if we were like let's say quitting, like not necessarily quitting, because I don't really think that we quit, but if going separate ways wasn't an option and we had to stick it out, yeah. I think we'd have to pick a side. Like someone had to be on the front end and someone had to be on the back end, at least yeah, for cool. at least to get it up and running again. Yeah, and to be yeah. out of the trenches because we were sort of in this little cycle of get a client outsource it, lose a client, get a client outsource it, lose a client. To get out of that rut, I think we needed to sort of pick a side, one on the front, one on the back, yeah. um, and then build it up to a certain degree. And then we can look at, you know, building better systems because then we'd have the cash flow to actually invest into the quality employees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah if I just look at myself, like what would I do differently? I think it would be learning, learning the media buying uh, quicker and taking that more serious. And whether it is to do it myself, to run the ads myself and you know keep the profit margins, or to just to be, be able to find a quality outsourcer, because it's hard to outsource something where you don't really know what to look for. Yeah. yeah. But like now, if I if I were to if I needed to outsource the media buyer now, you know, and I put up a job post on up where I'll be able to see right away who's the right fit and who isn't. Yeah. Whereas yeah. back then you could show me the most random portfolio and I'd probably say, Oh, that, that looks it looks good. So you probably, you know, you probably know what you're doing. Because then you can enforce the standards and the quality and the systems. Yeah. Because the, the thing is that's where, you know, in me now, because I I I don't run the ads myself, but I know an awful lot about them. Yeah. To the point where I know 
I can, if I need to do some quality control or check, and we've actually, you know, I'm in kind of a different position. We have someone on the team who does the quality control, but that has been stemmed down from what I put in place. So I, yeah. I know what I want to look for when it comes to that quality control. I know like we have a set structure right, with e-commerce clients, like, you know, the type of structure we have with top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, the type of ads, the way that we, the way that we test, that has all been decisions and stuff that have either come from me initially and been passed down or the, the, like let's say our media buyers say right we want to test this new strategy and it comes up to me and i have the knowledge to not be like if you think that's what's worked no like, i know what i'm talking about so i'm able to say yeah. yeah i agree with you i disagree with you let's tweak and change and i think that's one thing a lot and i agree with you completely and i would have to uh, completely align with you i think most people when they first start their business think that they can just outsource it which i think is fine if, if you're a complete beginner your first client I recommend you do get, you do automate it just because you can make sure you're getting those quality results, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn. I think you should invest yeah. your time and education heavily on learning the service that it is that you're offering because yeah, yeah. it will help across the board. And at the end of the day, it's a high ticket skill as well. It is, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's because even though you don't do the ads yourself, like before we started recording, we actually did yesterday when we were talking about ads and the change in the industry, you carried that conversation as if you were a media buyer. Yeah. Like, at no point did you not understand what I was talking about or vice versa. Yeah. You know, because you, 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 you were up to date with everything. Oh, yeah, like, I was 14 changes, this and that, and, you know, nowadays. Like, you, you were basically talking about the same things that I was thinking and talking about as well. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm the media buyer. Like, you mentioned the lookalike audiences and stuff. Um, yeah. And I think, like, that, that sort of, like, knowledge is just necessary have in order to be able to outsource it properly that's the thing you can education is everything it's like yeah. you know, the two people it's this whole it's the whole thing like i speak about this to my team all the time it's like you've got two people chopping down a tree someone spends five minutes sharpening it it's chopped down like we want to be yeah. those people because then we can chop down 50 trees while he's st still chopping down his first one and it's like yeah. that education and and staying up to date you know like you know it's so important and whether that is on the the service that you're offering whether that is on systems or whatever it is like yeah i think that was and that would probably be another thing i would do different if i'm being completely honest and transparent one thing i would probably do different is i when i first started i read like a shit ton of books right like i read loads of books um and that helped me tremendously after a certain while i think courses and, and above that mentors and coaches are so much more valuable than books after a certain time. I agree, 100%, yeah. Oh, sorry, mate, someone's at my doorbell, for fuck's sake, two seconds. <laughs> Every time I get mid, mid thing. Yeah, what so I was going to say, I think uh, coaches uh, and, and courses and that are so much more practical. The right ones, obviously, right? Not, not yeah. every single one, but... Um, and also learning from the right people. I think I learned a lot from the wrong people in the beginning. Like... Yeah. There's there's a lot of people who do a very good job of, of being gurus in the space, but don't actually do it. And you know what? You could you can't some of the information that you really need to get to the next level, you can only have if you've really been in the trenches. Yeah. Like, you know, I ran an agency before, but we didn't know anything about media buying back in the day. No. How much valuable would have that been? You can't learn that from someone who's just speaking about it. Like the only reason people like the reason you, you you're knowledgeable and i'm knowledgeable on the topic is because i'm in there and all my team's in there and you're in there on a daily basis yeah. and 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 that is those are the people that you should be listening to and i think i i would probably stop a lot of the time i spent reading books to programs and more applicable stuff i would say yeah no, I'm, I'm the exact same I'm like this is uh like financially this is probably the best year we've ever had like with with, with the agency um and this is probably like this year 2021 is probably the year i've read the least amount of books but i've invested the most into coaching like i don't think i've ever bought as many coaching programs and courses as i've done this year like more than even when i started out and when yeah. i started out i'd always try and if i had to choose when i started out between spending a whole weekend on youtube trying to find that one goal of nuggets yeah um, then I'll, I'll, I'll choose that over buying a course any day of the week Whereas now it's like, okay, I, I, I want to get to the same points. I want to know what's behind the kitten. I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll buy a course or I'll buy coaching. And exactly what you said, like sometimes you'll, you'll sort of get caught up in the branding or the marketing of, you know, the, 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 the gurus and, and stuff like that. And then you'll 
buy whatever it is that they're offering, you realize, okay, it's not actually what it's, you know, you can tell yeah. they're not actually doing this stuff because you can tell by the way they're teaching, the what they're saying, yeah. et cetera, it's not their expertise. And yeah, that's, that's definitely, I definitely agree with that. Like pick the right people and also look at, um, if, 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 if whoever's starting out now and someone is teaching or offering a program, actually look at the background and look at, okay, what are they actually still doing this? Is it something that they've done or are they just teaching the, the theory, the business model? Yeah, and that's yeah. like uh, what I also said right at the start. Like if someone would just look at the amount of time that we've been in the industry, like rather than just looking at what's, what's like new and what, uh, who's the latest guru now, no, yeah. we, we win over a lot of people, but it's just it's just not the way the world works. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because I make um, at the time of recording this anyway, I am planning to do some more coaching stuff uh, in stuff in the future. But I make the least amount uh, of money that I've made forever since I've launched my coaching business right now. All my income expense is, is I run an agency. And yeah. it's funny because I've not had time like last year up until this, you know, since I've had management put all these systems in place and my day's a bit different. I'm busy running an agency. I don't have time for a coaching business. Like, you know, I'm flat yeah. out like building this company. You know, we've, we've got offices, all these employees, all that stuff in the last 12 months. I've had to learn so much in the last months. I haven't had time for a coaching program, but now it's like, I feel like I'm even more qualified now than I ever have been before to, to coach and train I'm more so trenches, than ever yeah. because I've been in the trenches and um, you know, it's just, it's just a interesting thing. And on that note, you mentioned, you know, and I'd, I'd like to get your take on this. The, you said, you've invested more ever in coaching and courses in the last year than you ever have done. Okay. I wonder if that's because a lot of people, first of all, would think it's all about in the beginning you do that, but it's interesting to see that you've made the most growth and you've done that most this year. But is that also because you're established, you can learn one thing now, a golden nugget that can make you an extra 10 grand a month or make you an extra 20 grand a month. And because you've already got, because you're already yeah. established, the smaller things, that, and, the, and because you can implement them easily will make a bigger difference to you than maybe the beginner. Because yeah. I think about that a lot. Like I can watch YouTube videos now and get more value now with, even though I kind of know it, but like, it's like someone telling you away in a different way. Like hearing yeah. something that even is basic now will have more impact on my life, business-wise anyway, than something I probably would have learned five years ago. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think, when you start out, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So it's like, you, you're not even sure what you're missing. So you're sort of like on YouTube, on forums, on Facebook, in Facebook groups, like running around like a headless chicken, trying to soak up as much as possible. And then once you actually sort of get past that and you've got everything up and running off the ground, you're, you're much more specific in what you need to look for. But yeah. I think more importantly, with, with courses and coaching, one of the things I always look for is the community like in the group, in the coaching, in etc. Yeah. Because it's it's like if it wasn't for a community, we would never have met. You no, know, yes. it goes for anyone that I still speak to now or is established now, um, that I know personally and I speak to on a regular basis. I've all come from communities in courses and coaching programs that I've formed. Yeah. So like that for me, if it wasn't for those programs, then I would have never met a lot of people that have helped me along yeah. the way. Because so you I, think that's one thing I would look for. You think about it though as well. You say about like the community, but you go on it. You look deeper, longer term here. Um, but that that goes to so much more because we've met through a community, right? I, if you need, if you go into offices, employees tomorrow, yeah. I can fast track all this shit that's taken me twelve months, and we can jump on a couple of calls. And because we're mates, I'll just give it you all the information for free. First of all, it's free. Second yeah. of all get to jump straight to somebody who's done it just because you know them and you're going to save 12 months off the back of what i've done and then vice versa like you're even more on the ads on a day-to-day -day than i am so if i need to know something about media buying or change what's working for you i can message you and i can save tens of thousands of dollars of my clients ad spend on tests i can save clients leaving because stuff stops working i can come straight to you josh what have you found that's working mate like what's going on and yeah. In split second, I've got all the information, everything that I need, not through a course for a coaching program, but through through the person that I know off the back yeah, of that. So exactly. if you actually think about it, it goes a lot deeper. You know, if you have the, it's, at the end of the day, as they say, it's who you know, not what you know. And a lot of the times, yeah, I do agree to that to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, man. I think that's a a good little uh, point to, to to wrap this call up with. How long has it been? I've been checking my ninety minutes. Bloody hell, bro. Nice yeah, well, uh, 
probably wrap that up here anyway. Okay, guys, so that was the end of my collaboration, like two-part collaboration with Bradley Riley. Like I said before the start of this video, I highly recommend you subscribe to this channel if you've come over from Bradley's channel. And if you're already subscribed to this channel and you're unfamiliar with Bradley, hope that you know these two videos uh, basically you know, entice you to go over to Bradley's channel and subscribe to his stuff as well. If you want to know more about social media marketing, about starting your own agency and so on and so forth, check out the link in the description box down below. We can hop on a quick game plan call to see you know, what is the best program for you. If any, if there's no program that fits you right now, there's a bunch of free resources that we have available as well that can help you get started and so on and so forth. But anyway, like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video.